of Shiloh Baptist Church, one church in two locations. I am so glad you decided to join us. Check out our program, check out our viral worship, check out our church in general. There are a lot of great things happening at Shiloh. Please go to our website and see some of the great activities that we are doing here uh, in our area. Some of the things that we are doing to reach people for Christ. We are a kingdom church who believes in kingdom building, who is helping to change people's lives. Check out the message today. Go to our website. Check out our other messages. We are so glad to make you a friend of Shiloh Baptist Church. God bless you. This is Pastor Duncan saying, have a blessed day.
have I got a word from the Lord, or the Lord's going to speak a word to your heart. Um, I'm excited about it. I want to get right to the word. Our praise team was on fire, and now it's time for God to calm our hearts, build our spirits, and to give us something to live on. Will you go with me to a very, uh, I think it's a very well-known passage in some respects, and then in some it's not, but it's definitely a powerful passage in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Thank you, musicians. We're going right into the word. Acts chapter 20. When you have it, you know when we're talking about preaching out of the book of Acts, we're talking about the power of God when it first came down. Acts chapter 20. I'm going to begin reading at verse 17, and I need you to follow me from there. And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have shown you and have taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, except the Holy Ghost witness in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. Focus on that 24th verse. None of these things move me. For as long as the spirit of the Lord will allow, we're going to speak from this thought. Focus your fight on the upside. I'll say it again. Focus your fight on the upside. I was getting out of my car the other day, going to one of my meetings at a local social service building. And as I was getting out of my car, I turned around to get my mask. And when I did, it caught me funny when I saw this lady coming out of her car in this 90 plus degree weather, she had a sweater on a long sleeve sweater. She was walking in the building when I looked behind her. There were two young girls also behind her. Looked like they were dressed in bed clothes. Well, when I got to the door, uh, I caught her story because I had to sign in as I was going in the building. And I heard her say, the reason I got a sweater on is because I had to run out of the house because her partner, I didn't catch whether it was her husband, but her partner was beating her. Sad as it was, the children did not look hurt. That's immediately what I looked for to see had they been bruised or had they had any signs that they had been beating. But when the lady turned around, there was bruises on her face and on her neck and on the back of her arms. I felt so bad for them. But I looked at the children. They were sitting there giggling and playing behind their mother. But what made this story so tragic is not what was happening to the woman but what these children said after that. For I heard the mom say, uh, children, we're going to be leaving here pretty soon. And both of them objected. They said, mom, we want to stay here. We don't want to leave here. And they, she said, they said, it is hot at home, but it's cool in here. We like the air conditioner. So the woman saw that the worker was looking at her, so she explained, not only does this man beat us, but when he's angry at us, he turns off the air conditioner. That is a tragic story. I could have told you some other tragic stories because here is one thing I want you to zero in on as I start this message. Life is a fight. Life is a fight. There's no doubt about it. 
If you're going to survive, life means that you have to fight sometimes just to get from one day to the next. And not only that, I could have told you about the email that I just received. And I got this email this morning about a young lady who was killed in a car accident. Excuse me, her daughter, her seven-year-old daughter was killed in a car accident while she was driving. And not only that, she now has injured and has to have several surgeries they project. But she was injured to the point that she has to learn to walk again. Again. And she was so pitiful and so sorrowful because now she's figuring out how to raise her two-year-old daughter. So her 17 year, her seven-year-old daughter is dead. Her two-year-old daughter now is looking at a mommy that can't walk. I'm just telling you, life is a fight, and we all have to learn how to fight, especially in these times that we're living in. Do you know that right now there are over 152,000 deaths from COVID just in the United States? Do you know that over 10 million Americans have had to file for unemployment and it does not look like the job scene is getting any better. There's no cure on the horizon. And here we sit today trying to figure out how we're going to make it through. All I'm telling you is life is a fight and if you're focusing your energy on the wrong thing, then you're going to have a downhill battle. You're going to lose out. You're going to lose out on everything that you could win because you don't focus your life the right way. If you don't believe life is a fight, let me share something with you from the scriptures so you understand that. The first thing I want to tell you is we're all going to be tried. Ask Peter. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 12 and you'll see that Peter tells us, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that should try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Peter is saying, don't think it's strange when you're going through. Don't sit there and spend any time wondering how I'm doing what I'm doing. Don't worry about what's going on in your life. Peter said you need to understand it ain't strange. Somebody else is going through it. Not only must we all have to go through, we all are going to be tempted. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful and not allow you to be tempted above more than you're able. Not only must we all be tempted, not only must we all be tried, we must all suffer. You heard David say in Psalms 34, many are the afflictions of the righteous. I didn't like that when I first read because what David was saying is if you're a believer, look like you're going to suffer more than other folk. And not only must we all suffer, not only must we all be tempted, not only must we all be tried, we also must all fight our sin nature. That's right, I said in Hebrews chapter 12, it tells us that we need to lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us, knowing that we got to run this race with patience that God has given us. What am I telling you here? The the psalmist, I mean, Hebrews was not realistic because what he was telling us is lay it aside. But all of us know it's unrealistic to think we can just lay aside our sins. We're going to need some help to deal with that. Life is a fight, but also so you will understand that in this text, anybody who has made it in this life had found themselves in a battle. They found out that they had to focus their life on the upside and not on the negative side. What are you talking about, Pastor? I'm telling you that today I want to give you a principle, a divine principle that's seen all throughout Scripture, and that divine principle tells us that we have to make sure that we focus on the upside, no matter how bad our situation is. What am I saying? I'm saying that as long as God is on on our side, there is an upside. There's an upside to our struggle. There's an upside to our battle. There's an up upside to our losses. You just have to make sure that you find out what that upside is. You don't hear David? It says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. David, with no way out, everything falling apart in his life, found out that he had to encourage himself. Or here Moses is standing at the Red Sea with Pharaoh coming from behind. And Moses says, stand still. That's a strange command to tell somebody. But if you trust God, you'll know how to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And you'll see God coming through when you stand still. And here's Job sitting in a pile of ashes. Got a nerve to say, I know my Redeemer lives. All Job was trying to tell us is, don't focus on the negative, focus on the positive. And if you need one more witness, can I bring our Savior on the scene? Jesus Christ himself said, go ahead. Drive the nails 
in my hand. Go ahead, crucify me. But you know what he said? I shall rise again. Is there anybody out there that has some resurrection power on the inside of their life and know that God knew who, what he was talking about when he said he would rise again? Here's what I want you to know. I read those scriptures on purpose. I only read the A portion of the scripture because a lot of times you listen to the B portion, but you only use the B portion as a place to get a little momentary comfort. And that's not what God wants you to do. He wants you to learn that if you're going to fight and you will have to fight to make it, then why are you trying to fight wine or negative or on the bad stuff? Focus your fight on the upside. Live in the upside. You don't believe me? Listen to what this text says. If you listen to Peter, he said, They did not strange concerning the fiery trial that should try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But then there is an upside. He said, Rejoice, knowing that you are partakers of Christ's suffering. And when his glory is revealed, your joy should be revealed. See, that's not a momentary thing. You're supposed to live in the area of rejoicing. I'm talking to a brother out there or a sister out there that's going through some struggles. You need to learn that there's an upside that I need to live on or I'm not going to make it in this dark world. Not only, Peter, did you hear the text when it said we're tempted? And it tells us that all of us are going to be tempted, but God will make a way for us to escape. Watch this. He said that no temptation taking you, but such that is common to man. We all have to suffer. Watch this. The last part, the upside says, but my Lord will make sure you can endure it and he'll make a way for you to escape. You don't have to be tempted because you can get out of the temptation. All of us are going to suffer. You know, I, I read the text what David said. He said that many are the afflictions of the righteous. And I left this part out. I know you know you want to get some comfort and a little shout off over. Here's what it says. But the Lord shall deliver us out of them all. There it is. That's where you need to be, on the deliverance tip, not on the affliction tip. All Paul is talking about in his text is keep your mind on the product and not on the process. Many of us look at the process of what we're going through, but we don't realize our eyes should be on where God is taking us. He's bringing us somewhere. We're not out here all by ourselves wondering how we're going to make it. God is taking us through that process. And lastly, in Hebrews, it tells us that when we look at the, the upside of the text, it tells us all of us have to deal with our sin nature. Lay aside every weight, every sin that those easily beset us. Let me calm down, but this thing is starting to get to me, so i got to find out where I'm going. And it says, because that we have to worry about the sin nature that's in us, lay aside the weight, the sin. i got a sin that i got to wrestle with over and over and over again. But here's the upside. Don't ever give up. When you're wrestling with that sin, the upside says, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. So we need to understand that there is people out there right now, you're missing your blessing because every day all you do is focus on the negative. You know the kind of people I'm talking about. You run into them and every time they see you, they want to tell you what's wrong, what they're going through, what's happening in their life. And sometimes you run away from them because you don't want to run into them because you know that's all they have to talk about. And they think it's okay because they spiritualize it. You know what I mean by spiritualize it? They'll come to you and say stuff like, uh, I need you to pray for me. Or they'll say stuff like, I know God can fix it. Or they'll say stuff like, uh, the Holy Ghost knows what I'm going through. See, they spiritualize it, but then they commence to tell you every bad thing that has happened forever in their life. There's nothing wrong with asking for prayer. There's nothing wrong with saying, I know God can fix it. There's nothing wrong with knowing the Holy Ghost got your back. But here's the problem. Is that the only conversation you got? Will you ever see victory? Do you ever thank God for where you are and what you've been through? Have you ever sought God and gave him glory for the things you have handled? I know your child in jail, but he's still alive. I know you were in the hospital, but you're still breathing. You got out. So whatever it is, can I get at least three people to, to have some victory or to celebrate the fact that there is an upside? And if I made it through the downside, I am way ahead of the game. Look at this text. This powerful text. Paul tells us in verse 24, which we can nail down and understand this principle I'm trying to teach you. It's got to be, you won't fight, it's got to be a time for you to say, you know what? I'm going to live on what 
God has said to me. I believe El Shaddai. I believe that my great God, I believe the creator God has my back. So I don't have to worry what I'm going through. But Paul says something that caught me when I was reading this text. In verse 24, he says, none of these things move me. None of them. Paul, with all you've been through, left in the dead, whipped, beaten, shipwrecked, none of that moved you. Paul, what he said was, when you went to the New King James Version, that was the King James, he said, but none of these things move me. Here's what Paul is saying. It's not that I have not been through it, but what I realized is my God will carry me through. What I realized is it shouldn't move me to forget who I am and whose I am. It should not move me to sit out there and whine like I don't have some help. Do I have a believer that understands God is making a way for you right now? If you trust him, he's going to make sure that you focus your fight on on the upside. What's the upside, Paul? The rest of that verse tells us that I might finish my race with joy. There it is. Upside is I got to focus on everything God wants me to do and not get myself all focused on what's going on in my life. God must know what he's doing. Can we learn something today? Can we learn what the Bible says in this powerful four verses? I'm going to say, look, we, it's telling us how Paul survived all that stuff he went through. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I am shocked by seeing how joyful Paul is even though he's been through all of the trouble, the struggles, and the trouble that he has been through. So let's learn some stuff. I'm sorry, but today I got four points. Y'all know I try to tell you where I'm going, but they'll be really, very quick, but I need you to hear this. The first one is you must learn when you're going through your trial, you must learn as the first thing Apostle Paul said is I have consistency in my walk. I'm consistent. I, I don't keep going back and forth. God ain't got a guess where I'm going to be. Second thing is you got to be concerned about other folk. Come on, get your mind off of yourself. You got to be concerned about other people. God can't trust you because all you worry about is you. Then you got to be committed to action. Why did that stop you when you already have a history of God being able to handle anything? So you got to make sure you are committed to action. And then finally, you have to know, you have to be convinced that my walk is my life. I'm convinced I can't walk outside of God. Oh, that is good. I'm convinced. Some of y'all just trying to be saved. No, I'm convinced I cannot walk outside of my God. Let's get into this text. So uh, you, you, you got the point said. You, you must have consistency in your walk. You must be concerned with others. You must be committed to action. You must be convinced that your walk is your life. Then you won't deviate. We got to go back to understand in this chapter. Chapter 19 begins Paul's third missionary journey. As Paul was going on his third missionary journey, we find out that when he came into Ephesus, and when he did, he had just left Malaysia. He came into Ephesus. If you go to 19, there's some very familiar things happening in Acts chapter 19. First thing is there was a group of people that said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? And they said, we haven't even heard what the Holy Ghost is. And then Paul had to tell them. Now, I don't want to get very doctrinal here, but I got to let somebody know that when they say, have you received the Holy Ghost? They're not talking about your salvation. What I mean is there's some folk out there that will tell you if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. No, that's not what was happening. In this text, when you receive Jesus Christ, you receive all his gifts, you receive his spirit. When you get saved, you receive it all. You got to understand the dispensation. What was happening in here is the same thing that was happening when Apollos came to Priscilla and Aquila. They had been baptized into the repentance of John the Baptist, but they had not heard about Jesus. Understand, it was John himself who said, I baptize you with water, but there's one coming after me who will baptize you with Holy Ghost and fire. So you need to understand what they were telling them is, no, it wasn't that you weren't. You were baptized to repentance, but you had never heard about the salvation that came once Jesus left. It was in this text also that Paul himself, his handkerchiefs and aprons, check the text in 19, said they were healing people as Paul went by. I love that. That means there was an anointing, there was an efficacy of power that goes through us believers that our handkerchiefs and our aprons were healing people as they went by. That's the same way where the seven sons of Siva, that's what they did. They saw Paul healing 
killing everybody. So they start calling on the God that Paul know. I adore thee by the God of Paul. And the, and the demon didn't know them. Can I tell you something? Don't you get caught up thinking you're going to be casting out demons and you're not living right. Don't act like you just cast out a demon and you haven't read your Bible since last Sunday. All I'm telling you is you'll end up with the demon that's in them getting on you and them. So you got to know you can't be wishy-washy if you're going to be there trying to cast out demons. So Paul went down in this chapter and the last thing that happened, which is very apropos for where we are now, everybody wants you to be towering. All right, come on, Pastor Douglas. Make sure you stay politically correct. Let me tell you what politically correct is. Paul went into the city and there was idols. They had actually a business going, a silversmith business, where they were actually selling statues of the goddess Diana of Artemis. And all that means is there was this big uh, columns, there was, this, there was this big theatrical hall where Diana, the goddess, was supposed to be there. And she was supposed to be the one protecting them. You do know that why they rejected Paul so much is because all the other gods that the Romans had, they thought those gods were the ones that was holding up their life. And so they didn't like what Paul was saying. And the Bible particularly tells us there was Demetrius, the silversmith. He got the rest of them together. And Paul caused a riot. Do you understand me? Because what he said was, I don't want to offend anybody, but I'm going to tell you the truth about Jesus Christ. Can I give you some good news out there? If you're going to focus your fight Focus your fight on the upside, then every chance you get, you got to talk about God. No, you can't be ashamed. No, you can't hide your light. No, you can't do it because somebody might be offended. You ought to learn that I got to talk about Jesus Christ. So the riot happened. And if you look where we're picking up now, in verse 20, look at it with me. It said that it was after that time that Paul, after the riot ended, he ended up in Miletus. And he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. Get the setting. He knew, the text says, he was about to go into trouble, but he was going anyhow. You want to talk about power? Real power is when you trust God, you can't see it. You know things are going the wrong direction, but you trust God anyhow. And then he told them these words, from the first day I came to Asia, you know what manner of man I was. Here's what Paul said to them. He said, I have lived consistently all of my life. And the consistency that I have lived is the manner of man that I was. I had a prayer schedule. I had a praise schedule. I had a song schedule. I don't care what you did. I got on my knees and prayed to my father anyhow. I don't know what you were doing in your life, but I trusted my God anyhow. All I'm saying is I kept holding on to God. And Paul was saying the first thing you have to have if you are going to focus your fight you might have to fight. On the upside is you got to have a consistent manner in your life. You got to walk with God consistently so that God can trust you. Don't, all I'm telling you is that there's a blessing in the pressing. What are you talking about? I'm saying that don't you think, don't let anybody fool you when you see a whole bunch of holy folk. Walking around like, you know, they always want God and they always want to pray and they always want to trust God. No, there's some days we got to press. There's some days I got to make myself open my Bible. I know I'm not supposed to have that testimony. There's some days when I don't feel like preparing a message. I don't feel like preaching a Bible study. But then I think about how good God is. And that's when I realize there's a blessing in my pressing. Don't make me stay here. There's a blessing. How many times have you made your mind up to do what God said, even though your spirit didn't want to do it? You did it anyhow. And you got blessed because God was waiting on you just to be obedient. Right now, somebody listening to me. All God's waiting on is you to turn around. You told him you were going to do it. You didn't do it yet. But God said there's a blessing in the pressing if you will trust me. All God is telling us. Look what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3. He said, not as if, around verse 12, I have already obtained. Paul left us a lot of legacies that we can preach this message on. We know his character. He said, but I press toward the mark. Of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Can I bless somebody right now? There's always more in God. 
There's always a blessing in God you have not seen. God is always trying to take you to another level. All you got to know is our God is the God of more and better if I can trust him. There ought to be somebody in here who has a shout in them that came out spontaneously because God was better to you than you deserve. I'm going to let that marinate right there for somebody. How I many know that I had to look back and wonder, God, why are you blessing me like this? I never thought I would be here. Hasn't God brought you from some places you never thought you'd been? Hasn't God blessed you with some things you never thought you had? God gave contentment and peace and joy. And when you look around, you have to sometimes guess whose life am I living? That's the life of somebody who understands I'm focusing on the upside. There is always a better in God. God always has favor over those of us who will trust him and bless him. Do you know what I believe? I believe the reason Paul's prayers were answered was because God knew he's not going to see him Tuesday and not see him again till Sunday. God knew Paul was going to wake up and see him. So he trusted that he could give Paul what he needed because Paul was faithful and consistent in his walk. Do you know in this same chapter, you heard the story, it was a young man, Paul was preaching when he came to the elders at the first part of this chapter, and it says there was a young man named Eutychus, he was sitting in the window, and Paul was preaching a long time. You know, Paul was not like your pastor, he preached a long time. I preach short messages. But anyway, Paul was preaching so long till the boy fell asleep. And he fell out the window three stories. But I want you to catch this. Paul stopped preaching. Walked downstairs. Laid his body on the young man. Wrapped his arms around the young man. And told the crowd, I know he fell down dead. But because of the anointing and power of God that's in me, he is alive. If you check that text, Paul went back upstairs, preached until 12 o'clock, and then they say at the end, and Eutychus left and went home alive. I just believe God answers consistent people. I just believe when I get up in the morning, God knows that I went to bed with him last night. I'm going to talk to him lunchtime. I'm going to talk to him in the day. He knows that the consistency in my walk means I'm going to be there. I believe that's what happened to Jesus when he went to Lazarus tomb. Do you know the words Jesus said in Lazarus tomb? He said, my father, I know you always hear me. And he said, I need you now to provide that miracle. He said, Lazarus, come for hear me brothers and sisters Jesus Christ told us the works that he did we can do and greater works if we trust him Paul must have known that all I'm telling you is when you're consistent there's some things you can get from God that you can't get when you're not consistent when you focus your fight on the upside you get your blessings you get the plans you get the promotions you get the peace and contentment and one of the things I love God gives he gives an anointing of joy in in the midst of our difficult situations. Oh, there's a God out there that says, it's difficult, but if you got an eye for me, you will be rejoicing even in difficult situations. Not only that, we understand that consistency also means holding on to my faith. Holding on to my faith. I was looking at John Lewis's death and they talked about this heroic pioneer of civil rights. They talked about this man that never ever backed down. This man who always stood on the side for right no matter how many times he was persecuted. And I want you to know that he held on to his faith. Uh, I, I was at my mother-in-law's house watching Mississippi burning. Uh, the story of how they killed uh, those three social, those three workers, civil rights workers. And when we were watching the story my brother-in-law came in there and said man I can't watch this stuff how in the world did they put up with that what was he talking about we I, I, I try to go old school on you every now and then so I got to take you back to old school because what they had to do I watched my father get off the sidewalk for a white man when he walked by say yes sir no so they had second class citizenship they had to go to the back of the restaurant to eat they had to be treated they could be called boy out of their name no matter how much education they had they could get whipped and they were beaten and they were treat, cheated and they were treated illegally and treated unequally and yet somebody said how did they make it well let me tell you how they made it they were when I was growing up in church I heard all the old folk 
used to say, I'm holding on to my faith. I did not know what that meant back then when I was young. But how many know I done been through enough to know what it means to hold on to my faith? There's some days I got to hold on to my faith. You know what they did? I can see them. I think right after they got out those fields, those slaves, and right after they got off that picket line and got out of jail, because the church was the place where God's presence was. I believe they went to worship and to sing. I believe that's where they went to lift their hands to the Lord. And I can hear them back there saying, Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Let me stand. I am weak. I'm worn. I'm tired. But watch this. Through the storm and through the night, lead me on to the light. You know what happened to them? They found out their relationship with God was precious. My brother and sister, you're sitting here right now in a gold mine because you're in a relationship with the God of the universe who knows what you're going through. And he not only, you not only think he's precious, he thinks that you're precious. So all I'm telling you is they focused their fight on the upside, which was God on their side. They didn't worry about the struggles that were going on. And the last thing I want to say about consistency, and I'll move on quickly, is that you also have to be consistent. Watch this. Because you're going to need that power and growth for the problems that's coming down the road. I've seen many Christians get shipwrecked because they used to. Boy, I used to shout. I used to. You should see him. I would tear some. You should see the way I used to read. I was voracious. You used to. God knew that you got to be consistent because there's some problems that you were supposed to grow enough to handle. Paul, again, in 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 10, tells us this. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted but not forsaken. We're struck down, but not destroyed. Some of us can identify with that text because we have had demons on every side of our life, but we were not crushed. We've had times when we were perplexed. All perplexed means is you were confused. You were, you were, there was so much pressure coming on you, you didn't know how you were going to make it. But the only thing you know is you never went all the way to despair. Not only that, we were persecuted, but we knew somehow God wouldn't forsake us. And finally, we were struck down. I fell. There was a blow. But I never gave up because I knew that my God would not leave me in that situation. And today, I'm still standing. I'm a little shaken. I got some dents in my, in my shield of faith. My armor is a little banged up. But say, Jesus... And watch the blessing of my life. Then you got to have concern for others. Verse 20. Look what he said. Here's a, a big principle to how you get to focus your fight. It says, how I kept back nothing, verse 20, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly from house to house. How I kept back nothing that was helpful to you. There are a lot of saints out there who are going to miss their blessing because every level we go to, we have to pass a test. Every level, check the word of God. Everything we get from God is because God can trust us and we went past that test. We worked it out and we were blessed. When you are a negative person, you never pass that test. It's right here in the text. You got to realize that, okay, let's talk about giving. God can't give you anything if he don't believe you're going to pass the test of being able to give it to help somebody else. All I'm saying, the test says, God gives it to you. He doesn't give you cars. He doesn't give you houses. He doesn't give you money if you're not willing to give it to someone else. Do you realize that when we pass the test of stuff, when we pass the test of giving, God said we are blessed? As a matter of fact, in this text, verse 35, in this text, chapter 20, it says that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Somebody said, why, Pastor? Here's why. Because the more I give away, the more God gives back to me. I don't know how my God does that, but he gives it back, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Some of us won't give by anybody anything, so God can't give anything to us. That is a test. It's a test that we must learn to pass. The reason it's more blessed to give is because we then get connected with that divine resource in heaven. I got a witness out there. There's some stuff I got I shouldn't have got. There's some things God has done. I don't know where it came from because what God did, I got a divine hookup and I know that all of my needs are met. Not only that, you can't get forgiveness till you forgive somebody. I know where I'm at. You got to pass that test. 
God said, how can I forgive you your stuff and make you scot-free and clear your name when you won't forgive those that are around you? There's some of you in here right now. I know you don't like this part of my message, but you made up your mind. I'm not talking to it no more. I'm not saying it. Well, as soon as you do that, you uh, neglect the purpose that God brought you here for, and that was so you could love. Love is another one of those tests. Do you love people that are unlovely, people who don't love you back? I can tell you how I know this hurts the heart of God, because you go to Acts chapter 5, you find Ananias and Sapphire. They were sitting in there, and that, at that time, there were people who were starving, believers, in Jerusalem. And so the church got together and said, everybody's supposed to give something. They didn't tell you what to give. Ananias and Sapphire sold some property. And then they went in and gave one amount instead of the amount that God told them to give. I need you to catch that in the text. They gave the amount they wanted to give, but not the amount God wanted them to give. I don't think they would have been hurt then. But the Bible said they lied to the Holy Ghost. See, here's what I believe. It is the condition of your heart that determines whether God can bless you. When you're not concerned about other people, God can't bless you and can't be concerned about you. Paul said, I was so, there were people after me trying to kill me, but I taught you publicly from house to house. You know why I did it? Because you needed the Lord. Concern for others. The last thing, the first, next thing in this text is committed to action. Paul said in verse 22, and I, I go bound. Can you see him? In the spirit to Jerusalem. Knowing, not knowing what things will happen. He said, I'm going down. I'm committed to serve God. Sick or well. Anybody ever served God sick? Anybody ever served God made up your mind that I don't care what befalls me. God's still going to get the glory out of my life. I don't care how many times I have to struggle. I'm still going to trust God. He said, see, I go. Action. All I'm telling you is God knows how bad you're hurting. He knows what you're going through. But if you can be committed to continue to go, even though things aren't favorable, if you can be committed to continue to trust God, even though things don't look right, you will get a blessing. I got to help you right here. Because here's what you, I, I need you to understand. Paul has left us a legacy of why we must go. If you don't go, if you don't go, I'm only saying that again so you get with me. If you don't go, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 says, Why sit? Lest I be exalted above measure, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a angel, watch this, of Satan to buffet me. That word messenger means angel. One of Satan's angels to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. When you don't go and God has a task for you, an assignment for you, but you quit going. You know why you quit going? You start focusing on all bad things happening to you. You start focusing on this ain't fair. That's not fair. Why am I going through this? No. If you keep, if you don't keep going, and God knows the anointing that's in you. Here's what He said. He said, "I gave you a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan buffeting you." So, what does that mean? The word buffet means that it was dogging his tracks. It was following him. That, uh, some people say that the thorn was uh, Paul had an eye disease or the thorn was everywhere Paul went there was somebody demonically possessed. You got to check the text to find yourself. But here is what we do know. We know two things. That God allowed the demon to dog his tracks and we know that it was a messenger from Satan. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. When you don't go, all this message is saying is remember if you don't serve me, you still have to contend with the devil. Who are you going to serve? All I'm telling you is there's demons. You tried the devil already. You tried him before you fell, God. How did that work? So that messenger of Satan is just, just reminding you, man, if I go back out in the world, I know this is not going to work. I found something in God. Nobody has blessed me like God. Nobody has treated me like God. Nobody has been in my life and done the things God has done. What am I telling you? The messenger of Satan, I know you don't like it, but every now and then, God lets you look back and remember that the enemy is only coming to kill, steal, and You're going to do what? You're going to leave me. The enemy is only coming to steal, kill, and destroy. That messenger of Satan. I want God. God, just let me live my life. Don't let these bad things keep happening. But every time they happen, it drives me down to my knees. Then Paul said these words. 
He says, so I've learned how to rejoice in necessities and struggles and trials and tribulations because his grace is sufficient. God said, my grace will bring you over and there's nobody like me. Once you learn the lesson that there's nobody out there like God, you're not, there's someone sitting here right now that will tell you, I'm not going anywhere because I've learned how to hold on to God. There was this history professor as I hastened to my last point. Right here, history professor came and found out that one of his students was going to a cult because he was having some mental problems. Now the professor was in a college and he knew that he had to be politically correct or he might be fired. So he, every time he heard his student talk about uh, you know, going to get help at a call, he cringed. He wanted to like tell the student about the goodness of God and tell the student how he made it over. And he, he, you know how you get bubbling inside. You want to tell somebody what God did for your life, how he picked you up and cleaned you up and all he's done. But he said he never would say it. Two days, three days, the student didn't show up for class. And you know what happened? They found out later he committed suicide. You better hear me. If you don't go and do what God says, not only will there be casualties on people, do you know this man, when he wrote this memoir, said he had never been the same again. He let God down. When you let God down, that stays in your heart when you love God and you know what he's done. So what am I telling you? You better go when God says go because not only is there a thorn in the flesh, but God's grace is, is sufficient. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, I'm the only sure cure. All I know is I believe in therapy. I believe in medicine. But you better get therapy and praise God. You better take your medicine and get on your knees and pray. You better read whatever the latest trend is and give God some glory. Because all that stuff will fall apart, but in the end, God will still be standing. Is there anybody that knows that God is always going to be there when the rest of my foundation fades away? I find out that my father never left me. All right. Let's go to the last point. Because this, this, this is... The culmination that drove this entire message. You will have to fight, but you better learn to focus your fight on the upside. We found out that we have to be consistent in our walk. We got to be concerned for others. We got to be committed to action. And here is the here is what makes sure I don't fall off. Verse 24. None of these things move me. How did you get there, Paul? How did you get to the point that none of your struggles made you want to give up? How did you get to the point that nothing that happens makes you want to stop? Paul said, this is not a be, uh, don't worry, be happy message. This is a message of trust even when I can't see. This is a message of believing even when I don't know what is going to happen. Paul said, I go to finish my race with joy, the ministry God has given me. What am I telling you? Fight for your rights. As we close this message, listen to these closing points. Fight for your right. The upside is always the power of God. The upside is no matter how bad it is, I focus my life on the God who never fails. The upside says sickness, upside, he can heal me. Financial problems, the upside, he will supply my needs. Mental problems, the upside, he gives peace and passive understanding. Family problems, the upside. He will throw his arm around us and we can trust him to bring us through. I want you to get to the point in the world we're living in. I want you to get to the point that you understand with all the struggles that you've had, none of them should move you because of the goodness 
of God. God bless you. Remember, focus your fight for life on the upside. Right now, there's somebody out there you're not saved. I want you to hear these words very quickly. You can join this God who never fails. You can join this God who doesn't let you down. I want you to repeat these words after me. Say, Lord God, come on, come on. Help somebody out in the room. If you're saved, let somebody know. This is your chance. The world's not getting any better. Say, Lord God, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I thank you for giving me time to see your goodness and be saved on this side. I believe in my heart you died and rose again. I confess with my mouth because I believe it, because I'm confessing it. Say this loudly. I am saved. If you pray that prayer with us today, if there's somebody in your household that is saved, if not, um, we go to our website. You can become a virtual member of the church, but you don't even have to become a member of the church. Write us. Put something in the chat. We'll make sure that we contact you. If you're having some problems, we'll get one of our ministers to give you a call and pray with you. Shiloh is here to serve because we believe as we have embraced every gift God has given us is real life on the upside. Thank you for joining in. This is Pastor Duncan saying, don't miss our Wednesday night Bible study. I'm going to tell you something. There's going to be a tree on the new Wednesday night Bible study. We're, we're switching some things up. You'll hear about it this week. But there's going to be a blessing as you tune in this week with us. God bless you. Have a great day. I was down but with the no way up and I needed some help everybody breathing but not living just existing well and I needed some help somebody told me that Jesus will set you free Thank you.